Ephesians 3, 20 to 21. Now to him who was able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. We now will have a message from Daniel Kaplan. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. <clears throat> well, I wasn't particularly tasked with a, a specific topic or anything like that. So, you know, the feast is often a time that couples can get back together. It's kind of a extra honeymoon, a second honeymoon as well. So today I'm going to talk about all the metaphors and song of songs you were too prudish to understand. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Actually, we're going to talk about finding God in a pre-millennial world. Now, um, one thing that I did a few weeks ago at um, our church, we usually uh, I usually attend the Church of God Seventh Day, um, and I often give messages geared towards the youth. And I ask the young people, if you were asked to try to get closer to God, and you had a choice between two different places, uh, for a week, let's say, you know, often they say these things on Facebook, you can spend a, uh, two months in this luxurious place, but you have to give up football or something. So I was taking that analogy and I was saying, if you wanted to get closer to God and you had a week and you could pick a luxurious Manhattan penthouse or a lovely spot on an abandoned area of the Grand Canyon, what would be the best choice? Or is there even a difference, right? Well, the thing is, is oftentimes in the Christian world, when people talk about getting closer to God, they often talk about getting closer to nature. They talk about disconnecting. They talk about, you know, withdrawing. And to some degree, that makes sense. But to some degree, it doesn't necessarily jive with the Bible. Remember what it says, where it says, every, every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth. So something like the Grand Canyon is obviously a rather severe location. It's a very huge elevation difference. It's not necessarily the safest. It may not be even be for the best for humanity that it exists because it's a highly dangerous place to be at, um, which is probably one of the reasons why this verse is, is uh, talking about that sort of thing. I mean, around the Grand Canyon, you have all kinds of things. You have like <laughs> rattlesnakes and scorpions and... Um, vicious animals, you know, so just observing nature, you're going to see a lot of predatorial things. You're not necessarily just going to be in this wonderful, harmonious, you know, existence. You're going to be at odds. You're going to be at odds with the sun, which is incredibly severe there. Um, it's not necessarily that conducive. And think of how many places in this whole earth that you're actually fighting against just the environment itself. I mean, I grew up in California, which is a very pleasant place to live. It's a very temperate climate. It's pretty easy for a human to live there. But there's only so much land mass that's like that, which is one reason why it's very expensive to live there. And as it says, you know, the desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Hot sands will become a cool oasis. Thirsty ground, a splashing fountain. So these extremes is not necessarily the intent you know but why would god necessarily create a environment for people to live on that has just such ridiculous extremes and so here's the other thing let's say you're living out there at the grand canyon you're kind of off on your own it's nice from a certain standpoint in terms of you know you don't have the influence of other people you don't have to see the negative behaviors you can maybe disconnect, reflect, all of those things. But remember what Jesus said about being the light of the world. A town on the hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. It's not necessarily our intention that once we know the truth and the way that we go off and seclude ourselves because what purpose does that really serve to the greater humanity? Now here's the thing, one of the reasons why people will look at something like a Manhattan penthouse or something like that and see a lot of negativity and maybe not so much of a religiously edifying thing is they see so much stuff that is man-made, man-made chemicals, man-made light, you know, all of these things that humans have created and so is that maybe not the best? Is there something issue with not being natural, you know, and that's such a 
uh, talking point now, even in the secular world. It's we want to be all natural. We want to avoid all this, you know, extra stuff that man is messing up because nature is perfect as it is. You know, nature is God. Well, no, not really. <laughs> Um, because the truth of the matter is, is we live in a world that is highly adjusted from the one that God intended. And so even though people might get, you know, worried about what we're doing to our food and all of this, if we go back to the very beginning, you know, that's a very good place to start, as Julie Andrews said. God said, let us make mankind in our image and our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. It's very interesting what he says our role is. It is dominion. <laughs> we have the ability to affect things. We were put from the very beginning. Now, this is plan A. This is not even after the sin. This is at the very, very beginning. The intention was that we would be involved. We weren't just put here just to exist. We were put here to affect things. Um, and if you look at Strong's uh, Concordance, which has officially been making somewhat educated speakers seem reasonably intelligent since 1890, <laughs> you can see how this word is used in other parts of the Bible. Like, for example, in Psalm 72, where it says, He shall come down like rain upon the grass before mowing, like showers that water the earth. In his days the righteous shall flourish and abundance of peace until the moon is no more. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. This is talking about God, not us. But you can see dominion, it's, it's a powerful world, word. This is not just a guardianship or very loose thing. This is a very uh, strong word. It's, it's meant to indicate a lot of power. Um, Another word, verse that uses it out of Jake, one shall have dominion and destroy the remains of the city. Again, you're talking about a lot of ability to affect things and change. James even references uh, how much we affect things when it says all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. And it uses that in terms of, but we can't control ourselves, we can't control our tongue. But it's pointing out the fact that this is something that we have the ability to do. It's not saying it's a negative thing that we're doing. It, it's something that we have been tasked to do. If we go back again to the very beginning, once you have dominion, you have the next step, and that is God took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work and take care of it. Again, this is something that is a task. This isn't, you know, I'll put you here and you can just observe all those wonderful things that I did and just soak in the loveliness. It's, it's work, and obviously later it gets worse in terms of what our work is. It's much more difficult, but the idea that we weren't supposed to be involved in the process is from the very beginning. We, we were supposed to be involved in the process. The word that comes to mind is cultivate. You know, that's a very strong word. That isn't, again, just a passive observation of nature. That is, you're affecting things, you're doing things. And let's go even further. This is, again, all before the fall of man. God, uh, now the Lord had God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. Naming is a very powerful thing. I mean, let's be honest, especially in the Bible. It's incredibly powerful. One of the first things that God does is he names the day and night. It's, you know, it's a huge thing. Um, later, you know, he changes the name of Abraham because he wants to have his name to have meaning. A lot of names in the Bible have a lot of meaning. It carries a lot of weight. It's a very uh, powerful thing. And in, even in science, you can prove naming something is a very powerful thing. For example, if you look at these two pictures right here, uh, most American audiences can clearly see the blue square on the right side, right? There's actually tribes in Africa that can't see that square because they do not have words for blue. And so in their mind, they don't differentiate as much. Now, what they can do that we can't is they can more easily see a green square in the mix of green squares that is a slightly different color because they have 10 different words for green. So naming something and having the ability to talk about it, to communicate about it, dramatically affects the thing itself. And this is something that God had tasked Adam with from the very beginning. This is a very powerful thing. This isn't a passive you know, sort of existence again. So we have 
all of these factors lining up. We have dominion over the animals, we have dominion over the plants, we have the ability to uh, say what they are called, how to discuss them. And let's go a little bit further. And then the next thing he says, you know, be fruitful and multiply. He again reiterates dominion. Now, I mean, what's interesting about the be fruitful and multiply is again, it's, it's, it's a proactive thing. It's not just, okay, have lots of kids and stuff, but be fruitful, I think, is just a general concept. Try to have a productive life. There's no reason to just exist and just coast through your life. And at that point in time, what kind of productivity could he have? A lot of it would have been involved in nature, affecting it in some way. What the initial intention was, I'm not exactly sure, but obviously that is the intention from the very beginning. All right, so now we come to the part where things get a little bit muddy because we mess things up and we have, you know, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the, pla the plants of the field. And here's the thing. I mean, now we live in a world where nature is just at odds with us by default. It's not the way we intended. So every time we observe something in the natural world, we're observing a... Uh, obscured version of what God created. We're not seeing the original source. It's like if you take a really great audio recording and you keep degrading it and you eventually get to a point where maybe you can't even tell exactly what it was supposed to sound like. You know, how exactly messed up it is, we don't completely even know. We can speculate based on the uh, principles and the ethics and the morals and all these things about what we observe in nature, but it's, it's very difficult for us to even get to the source right now. As it says, uh, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. I mean, this is affecting everything right now. So that being said, the earth is a pretty broken place. But thankfully, this uh, holiday and celebration depicts a future time, a time when that's no longer going to be the case. So for now, we don't really have... You know, the concept of like all natural, whatever, doesn't really exist because we don't know what God's natural was. We can only kind of get as close as we can. But soon we will get to actually see that. We'll get to see what the default experience was supposed to be. We're going to get to see what the world was supposed to be like. As it says, you know, he'll wipe away every tear from the eye. Death is gone for good. Tears gone. Crying gone. Pain gone. All the first order of things gone. I mean, this is an extremely different world than we live right now. It's hard to even imagine what a world without pain would look like. If you talk about, you know, writing a story, I'm somebody who's written books, you know, the, everybody always tells you the first thing you have to figure out is what is the conflict. Well, you're talking about a world that almost doesn't have conflict. And that almost seems boring <laughs> because we don't really understand what that would be like. It's like, well, what would you fight against? What would be the purpose? Um, if you got to, you know, and um, I, it's very fascinating to me just to even speculate about it just because it is so vastly different than where we are now. And truth of the matter is, is the good thing we know is we are the solution. You know, we are actively living now in a world knowing all these things, you know. So when we go out into the world and we observe this predatory behavior from animals, predatory behavior from humans, we have the actual you know, wisdom of God to parse these things out as best we can, but we certainly have a big jump start on other people and a lot of comfort in knowing that a lot of these things that don't make a lot of sense about the world, you know, shouldn't because it's a messed up world. Um, it's interesting when I see people, they get into these, uh, into the weeds a little bit about, you know, creation versus intelligence design. And a lot of people will be like, well, intelligent design isn't all that intelligent. And the truth of the matter is, is no, it's not because it's not really the intelligent design. It's a complete uh, messed up version of what was the intelligent design. So anything you can find in humans or animals, you're like, well, that doesn't make logical sense. I could probably tell you, you know, it may not make logical sense, but that may not be the way it's supposed to be anyway. So we're not really discussing the same thing. You know, as it says, we are the salt of the earth, but as the salt loses its flavors, how shall it be seasoned? Isn't there then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men? It's our, you know, purpose in life to be out there in the world, to be sharing this uh, hopeful vision of the future, to be, you know, talking about the issues of the world. It's easier to deal with a lot of the 
conflict and the difficulty that people have with accepting God as a higher power if you at least acknowledge the fact that, you know, the natural world is so messed up because, you know, it explains a lot of things in terms of suffering and whatnot if you just know the system itself is broken. It's not the way it's supposed to be. As it says, we're supposed to be light. And the thing about light is that, you know, when it's darkest is when you're going to notice the light the most. Mm -hmm. And so often we can get very discouraged when we feel like we're in a very dark place. But that's often when we can be the most helped people, when we can be the biggest voice in the wilderness, as it were. Um, people can be very confused and very troubled, and we can try to bring clarity the best we can into these sort of situations. Now, ultimately speaking, we know the truth. We know what's going to happen. But the question is, is, is it necessarily going to be a light switch? Is God necessarily going to come down and, you know, whatever, snap his fingers, anthropomorphically speaking, and the world be fixed? It's an interesting concept that I've thought of, because if you look at what the verse says, it says, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all, our, all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. I find it very interesting that the reason why it says that, it says that the reason why this is going to happen is because the knowledge is so ever-present. Um, I mean, and if you look at just the math, all right, right now, $1.6 trillion is spent globally on warfare. And that's just an estimate. It's probably low. Imagine if all that money was spent on things like, I don't know, curing cancer, helping people out. Um, just a default change of attitude would create a dramatic shift in the, our global outlook without even a supernatural influence. Now, granted, the supernatural influence have become of the wisdom that we can't possess. But we have so many tools right now that could actually create a lot of these things and, and help the world out so much more than we do. I mean, we can make fish that glow in the dark. <laughs> um, people are coming up with genetic stuff all the time. It's very interesting. And it makes you wonder, I mean, ultimately... Are we going to the point where we can either save each other or blow each other up? People have been talking about this a long time. Um, and it's an interesting scenario. It's like, well, why has mankind been allowed to exist for so long? I mean, speculation, but maybe the point is, is that we need to get to enough knowledge that we have the ability to go completely one extreme or the other, and that's when all things are going to come to a head. It's possible. I mean, it's, 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 it's a plausible scenario. And if you think about a parent and what they tend to do with, you know, a child is they give them more and more responsibility as they grow up and they eventually hope that they can take on a lot of these tasks themselves. They don't necessarily want to swoop in on their 18th birthday and say, okay, now that you're an adult, I'm going to fix everything. They kind of hope that at that point they've come to the conclusion that they can do a lot of it themselves. So I just think it's a very interesting way of looking at things. I mean, I, I don't know if that is what's going to happen. It could just all be supernatural and then out of, out of this supernaturally inspired world people will understand the way life is supposed to be and then be able to move forward from there from a new default it's very possible but we also may be able to make our the be able to be affected into our new default as well we, we certainly are getting there technologically speaking and as time goes on it's going to get closer and closer remember when we, when we came down to it in the Garden of Eden, the ultimate negative choice was not necessarily that they were wanting to have information. It was knowledge of good and evil. It was a moral decision that was the problem. Humans are not really capable, or certainly weren't at that point capable of making moral decisions. Now, maybe eventually that was the goal, but they were jumping way ahead to a decision that they couldn't make at that time. It was never God's intention to make us ignorant or anything. Obviously, if we're taking care of animals, as I showed you, dominion and all of that, we're somewhat informed in what we're doing. We can't have all that ability and all that responsibility if we don't even have information about the world around us. So ultimately, my takeaway from all of this is just to keep in mind that we are the solution. We are here to let people know that the world is, you know, the mixed up place it is, but it's going in a much more positive direction. We already have a lot of the tools to help it ourselves if we could just do it and not fall into all the traps of all the stuff that we're seeing around us. And I'm going to leave you with uh, something from Paul. 
He says, if our message is obscure to anyone, it's not because we're holding back in any way. No, it's because these other people are looking or going the wrong way and refuse to give it serious attention. All they have eyes for is the fashionable god of darkness. They think they can give them what they want and that they won't have to bother believing the truth they can't see. They're stone blind to the day spring brightness of the message that shines with Christ, who gives us the best picture of God we'll ever get. Remember, our message is not about ourselves. We're proclaiming Jesus Christ, the Master. All we are is messengers, errand runners from Jesus for you. It started when God said, Light of the darkness, and our lives were filled up with light as we saw and understood God in the face of Christ, all bright and beautiful. If you only look at us, you might well miss the brightness. We carry this precious message around in the unadorned clay pots of our ordinary lives. That's to prevent anyone from confusing God's incomparable power with us. As it is, there's not much chance of that. You know for yourselves that we're not much to look at. <laughs> We've been surrounded and battered by troubles, but we're not demoralized. We're not sure what to do, but we know that God knows what to do. We, we've been spiritually terrorized, but God hasn't left our side. We've been thrown down, but we haven't broken. What they did to Jesus, they do to us. Trial and torture, mockery and murder. What Jesus did among them, he does in us. He lives. Our lives are at constant risk for Jesus' sake, which makes Jesus' life all the more evident, evident in us. While we're going through the worst, you're getting in on the best. So we're not keeping this quiet, not in your life. Just like the psalmist who wrote, I believed it, so I said it. We say what we believe, and what we believe is that the one who raised up the Master Jesus will certainly raise up with you alive. Every detail works to your advantage and to God's glory. More and more grace, more and more people, more and more praise. So we're not giving up. How could we? Even though on the outside it often looks like things are falling apart on us, on the inside where God is making new life, not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. These hard times are small potatoes compared to the coming good times, the lavish celebration prepared for us. There's far more here than meets the eye. The things we need now are here today, gone tomorrow, but the things we can't see will last forever. So my uh, takeaway from this is just to focus on the future um, and uh, keep using the Bible as your lens to observe the world you're in right now. I hope you have a great festival to wrap.